Turn with me, please, to 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. May God bless his holy word. Well, I want to speak to you just a while this morning about how to cope with criticism in the ministry. 85% of ministers have designated criticism as the most problematic issue they've had to deal with in the ministry. And what has been most astonishing to me is how little has been written, discussed at conferences on this very practical, important subject. And what happens in many ministers is they develop a kind of shell. They're unreachable as people, ultimately, because they're trying to cope with criticism and they put up a shell. Or else they become internally very bitter and develop a pessimistic attitude to the ministry itself. And really, a pessimistic minister is little better than a proud one, because actually pessimism is rooted in our pride. Since ministers become pessimistic because they often think at bottom that they deserve better treatment than they're getting. And that ultimately is pride, isn't it? And in some cases, we, we may be right when we feel that way, but we're failing to exercise self-denial as our Master did, who suffered far worse things at the hands of men than we will ever suffer, as First Peter 2 has just recorded. And yet he did not retaliate at all. So how can you, how can you not retaliate? and cope with criticism and not become bitter and have an optimistic, wholesome view of the ministry? How can you be like Paul and be in prison and write a letter to the Philippians and say, Rejoice, and again I say unto you, Rejoice. How can you say with Paul in Philippians 4.11, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I'm sure we all realize that that no one appreciates a pessimistic, complaining, whining, bitter minister. But how do you cultivate an attitude of joy and peace and strength by God's grace in the ministry that is positive and upbeat for your people in a biblical way? And yet avoid insomnia and exasperation and resignation and cynicism when you get all this criticism. Well, what I want to do in this hour is give you, I think it's 10 or 11 um, things to consider. Number one is consider criticism inevitable. Consider criticism inevitable. At one point in my life, I got great comfort from reading in John Wesley's diary that he said he once questioned if he was truly right with God since he had received no criticism for the entire day. (laughs) See, it is futile to think that you can avoid criticism in the ministry. Andy Stanley engaged in what he calls visioneering. And really, every minister is a visionary, isn't he? If if you're not going to do anything in the ministry, maybe you can avoid most criticism. As one minister said to me, my church is so peaceful, at our last three annual congregational meetings, not a single question was raised about anything. As if that was possible. But if you're a visionary, you're going to be implementing 
changes. And implementing changes brings about criticism. So this belongs to the occupational hazard of the ministry. It comes with the turf, brothers. It's what we need to expect. There's an old Dutch saying that says, he who stands in the front must be expected to be kicked in the rear. <laughs> See, if you're going to proclaim the whole counsel of God, as you should, you're going to get criticism because when you proclaim the whole counsel of God, you're going to be stepping on toes. When you step on toes, you get criticism, particularly if you step on the toes of people's children. When I visited a dear brother named Ernie Riesinger, who has helped many, many ministers, a very wise man who's now gone to be with the Lord, he's a Banner Truth trustee, perhaps many of you know him, but I visited him in his home and he took me out to a restaurant two years after I was in Grand Rapids. I've been in Grand Rapids 23 years now. And uh, he asked me how things were going. And I said, uh, Ernie, I, I, don't, I don't really know, but there's something about Grand Rapids. That either the people hate me or they love me. Like nobody's neutral. <laughs> and he took his great big former construction hand and he slapped it across my knee and he said, that's great. <laughs> so it doesn't feel very great. But he said, that's great because, you see, it means you're getting through. Because people respond. Woe unto you, Jesus said, if all men speak well of you. Luke 6, 26. So expect criticism and don't be devastated by it. That's number one. Number two, consider the source. Who's criticizing you? Is it an office bearer that you need to work with every week? Is it a mature believer? Is it a babe in grace? Is it an unbeliever? Is it perhaps a fringe member of the church? Do you know that 85% of the criticism that ministers get today come from people who are fringe members to begin with? Is it perhaps a very highly critical individual who's criticized the last four ministers that have come along? Is it someone who just is completely ignorant of what they're doing? It makes a big difference. Who's criticizing you? Now, if it's someone who really means your welfare, if it's an office bearer, for example, who really wants your ministry effective, you, you've got to take that criticism very, very seriously. And the more sincerely you can genuinely welcome constructive criticism, the more your ministry and your relationships with others will benefit from it. And yet, on the other hand, we've got to be careful that we don't respond excessively to complaints that are raised by just a few especially complaints that really have little substance to them. I remember my first church, we had, we had a meeting where we had three ladies come from the, the Women's Guild to complain about something. And so we heard their case and we said, yeah, well, that, that sounds really reasonable. So we changed the decision. I forget even what it was, but it was something that would impact all the women. Well, at the next meeting, we had 25 women. <laughs> so sometimes two or three complaints you know, may not just in themselves be substantial enough to, to change things. You need to look at the body as a whole. And don't jump with every little complaint that comes your way or the church's way. Now, if three people complain and you have a church of uh, 15, you better, you better look at the complaint quite seriously. But if you have a church of 700 and three people complain, that's probably uh, not, not a big deal in itself. So consider the, consider the source, who's complaining, and then consider their motivation. Consider their motivation. What's making them tick? Are they perhaps jealous of you? Are they concerned about the real well-being of the church? Are they being selfish? What's their hidden agenda? 
Are they feeling excluded? Speak to them. Open them up. Get them to lay their cards on the table. You can draw them out. You've been trained how to listen to people. And uh, you'll find out the truth if you give them enough time to talk and to express their concern. One of our problems as ministers, of course, is when people start to express their complaint, we start having answers before we've heard them out completely. And so we short-circuit the whole process. And we don't even learn to know the motivation because we've cut them off. And they then go back to other people and spread the word around the church. You know, the minister really can't cope well with the criticism. He cuts you off before you even get done. So no use going to him. So they become more critical. Now, I, I grant you it's hard, and I'm, I'm by no means the best example of this, but I try with all my power to listen to the person, to draw them out. And I've got a thousand things I want to say sometimes, but I hold my tongue and just let them speak. Let them speak. Let them speak. Let them speak. So, sometimes I'll say, is there, is there, do you have any other concerns at all? Just let them get everything out. Now, yes, yeah, painful. But it's far better doing it that way than having the thing drag out for years. So, consider who's criticizing you. Consider the motivation. And then, very important, consider yourself. Critics are often God's gifts to guard us from being self-satisfied and self-destructive. What do I mean by that? Well, the Holy Spirit uses our critics to keep us from justifying and protecting and exalting ourselves. If I didn't have critics, I'm sure I would go too far in this direction or too far in that direction. Critics have a way of kind of juggling us back into the, the racetrack and so we don't wander the byways and, 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 and go to extremes. And although critics often exaggerate their case, in fact, 99% of the time they do. Maybe that was an exaggeration. <laughs> they are seldom entirely right, but they're also seldom entirely wrong. And usually there's something you can learn from your critic. The worst thing we can do when someone criticizes us is get real technical about every word they say. When they finally get a chance to pour out their, get everything off their chest and put everything on our chest, when they finally get a chance to do that, they're prone to use language that's too strong. They're prone to say something like this. Well, Pastor, always when you, I, 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 you interrupt them. Always? Is it always true? See, and then they're defensive. And then you get into this entanglement of war of words. Just let the word always slip by. They don't really mean always. What they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to see this problem area that you are not addressing rightly. So, don't take every word so literally and henpeck every word. But... Get the global drift of what they're saying. What's bothering them? And is there some truth in what's bothering them? And generally there will be a little bit of truth in it. So you need to ask yourself as you consider yourself, am I responding appropriately to criticism? If I claim as a minister to have an ear for Christ, shouldn't I have an ear for his people? And if you find yourself habitually feeling slighted and neglected and mistreated in the ministry, you ought to view, view those feelings with some suspicion. Most people really want to treat their minister well. You want to let yourself be more vulnerable here. You will complain less if you consider how little criticism you receive when you recall how unworthy you are to serve the Lord Jesus Christ 
who is perfectly worthy. It's amazing how quick we are to defend ourselves. We say we believe in total depravity, but when someone accuses us of any depravity at all, we rise up in arms. We say we're not perfect as ministers, but when anyone accuses us of any particular sin, we're ready to go to bat for ourselves 100%. I had an elder several years ago who really spoke out against the ministry so strongly that the elders had to rebuke him. And he didn't repent. And finally he said, all right, I repent. You can charge me of every sin, all ten commandments. I'm a sinner against all ten commandments. But against that sin of bearing false witness, I'll never agree to that. You see, he, he, he just said he, he's guilty of all ten. But when you, when you specified it, you see, he wouldn't face that sin. And that's the way we can get as ministers as well. So we need to be able to learn to say, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? If you never find yourself saying that as a minister, something's wrong with you. When we're making hundreds of decisions in the ministry, we're having thousands of interactions with people. Come on, we're not going to do all these things perfectly. And, yeah, we fall short many, many, many times, so why not just admit it? So people come and they say something to you and you admit, yes, oh, oh yes, I, yes, I should have done that differently. So instead of trying to defend yourself, which is usually the worst policy, try to admit as much wrong as you can while yet being realistic. You don't have to admit you're wrong in things where, where you're not wrong. But go as far as you can with your credit. And ask them for forgiveness. And you'd be amazed how many people come right around when you just simply say, I was wrong. Please forgive me. But what if they're 70% wrong and you're 30% wrong? You admit you're 30% wrong. And you ask for their forgiveness. And when they've forgiven you, and they usually will at that point, I mean, maybe, maybe what they'll often do is they'll say, well, yeah, come to think of it, I was, you know, wasn't altogether right here either. And then the 70% will come out. But if you try to go up to 70% before you've admitted your 30%, you can get into a tangled mess. So, consider yourself. And one thing that can really help you here is to develop accountability partners to, to monitor your reactions. In my consistory or session, whatever you call it, with elders and deacons, for the last 20 years in my ministry, I wish I'd done it in the first 12 as well, but I didn't. But the last 20 years, I've always had one elder that I thought was very wise. And I've pulled him aside particularly and said, Will you be my accountability partner in the consistory meetings and in the ministry? And tell me at any time where you see me acting inappropriately for, for being a servant of God. Would you be, have the honesty to come to me and just, just talk to me lovingly about it? And I've never asked a man who's refused that request. I picked them out carefully. <laughs> but the last one, the, the, the newest one that I've got now, is, is, is really interesting because when I said, you know, I've got some weaknesses and I need, I need to be monitored, he said to me, well, I've got some weaknesses and I need to be monitored too. Will you be mine as well? In the consistory room. So that's a neat thing. When you can have each other and be confidential with each other and help each other be just a tad bit more wise and a little more self-controlled. A second kind of accountability partner you might want to develop is someone who's outside of your denomination. That can be a huge help, particularly as a fellow minister. I always have a couple ministers in different denominations. Well, I've asked Joy Piper actually, uh, counsel and advice in a few situations. And I've done that with some other ministers of other denominations. It's far less threatening because that minister is not going to go tell that minister who's going to tell that minister. So you can ask, 
how would you cope with this particular criticism? See, ask another minister. I remember I had two very close friends who deserted my ministry, left the church, and I was hurting. I mean, I was hurting big time. I felt like David, my known familiar friend that lifted up his heel against me. And I tried. I mean, I knocked my head against the door trying to get back into the good graces of these two men. And it wasn't working. And I finally called a friend in Illinois, a pastor friend from another denomination. And I said, you know, this is what's happened. This is what I've done. Uh, I, this is where I admitted I was wrong. And I just can't get that friendship back. What must I do? And there was a pause. He's it, a very wise man. And he said, Well, Joel, there's a text in Proverbs that says, A brother offended is harder to win than a city. And he let that sink in for a while. And then he said, I think you've got 700 other people to look for, look after. You can't spend all your time trying to win back two. Let that sink in for a while. And he said, I think you need, it's time to move on. Commit it to the Lord. You've done what you can. And I hung up the phone and I said, all three of those things are so obvious. And yet I was completely blind to them in my frantic need to get these two men back. I just had to let it go. That was wise advice. And then thirdly, the best accountability partner of all is your own wife. Providing she's a wise woman. Like mine is. <laughs> you didn't hear that, Mary. <laughs> because with your wife you can be totally honest, can't you? She knows you through and through. Just one caution. We men can color our stories about our critics to our wives so that our wives actually become more critical of our critics than we are of our critics. <laughs> so we've got to be very careful that we are completely honest with them and try to present the material objectively. But they can help us a great deal. They can help us a great deal. And when our wives gently correct us, gently suggest where we've gone over our boundaries, we had better listen to that. Generally speaking, women have better tuition than men anyway when it comes to interpersonal relationships and where boundaries are. So consider yourself in all these ways. Develop accountability partners and don't think you're self-sufficient. See, as soon as you think you're self-sufficient, you can handle all these things by yourself. That's when you come in trouble. Because then you're always right and everyone else is always wrong. That's where bitterness and callousness and lots of ministerial problems surface. Number four, consider timing and prayer. Consider timing and prayer. The physical setting and timing and situation out of which the criticism comes can help you determine whether it's helpful. But whether it's helpful or not helpful, you need some space and time, generally speaking. To respond to, unless you're, I, I, have, I have one colleague in the ministry in our denomination, just one, who can respond immediately to criticism with such objectivity that it's amazing. I don't know how he does it. I need some space and time, and I'll generally try to get 24 hours. If I can have 24 hours to pray about it and to let the intense wave of feeling that comes over me subside, I can handle it so much better. So let's say I get an email just lambasting me from A to Z. What's my response? Well, my response is to type the email right back. But I've learned I can't do that. I need 24 hours. And usually if I have 24 hours, I can send a message. Well, actually, I never send a message back. That's one of my rules. I never answer criticism from email by email. I always call the person. Personal contact is always better. And I train actually our theological students. Never should you as a minister ever criticize anyone by email either. Whenever you want to criticize someone, call them up. Get face to face. When you want to compliment someone, 
Send them a formal letter. You know, they can print it out. They can hang it up. But when you criticize someone, face-to-face is always better. So consider timing and then consider prayer. Prayer time is actually critical. When you bow your knees and pray over criticism, you make yourself so much more vulnerable. And there's a lot greater chance you'll admit your own wrongdoing when you do that, when you come face to face with God. And do remember that you are more known in the congregation for your reactions than for your actions. So you'll you'll develop a reputation as to whether or not you're approachable. Every one of you men in the ministry right now, 90% of your congregation has an opinion on whether you're approachable or unapproachable when it comes to criticism. And if your reputation is you're unapproachable, you may think things are going pretty well in your church. But there's things simmering inside of your people that they haven't been able to express to you. Things aren't as well as they should be. Truth has a way of eventually vindicating itself And so, do remember in your reactions that you can't always resolve everything right away. Some things take time, more than the 24-hour time. Forcing solutions to issues too hastily can make a bad situation worse. Sometimes we just need patience. Some situations will yield only to the healing touch of time. You see, sometimes we're like fathers to our, to our congregation, aren't we? And you know what it's like with children. You, you, you see your child going down the wrong way in some way, and you say, I wish I could stop him in this particular area, but he's almost determined. He's got to learn it for himself. Sometimes our people are like that. They're judging us about something, but we know we're right in that particular area. But we've got to give them time to see the light of that particular thing as well. Luke 21, verse 19, puts it this way, In your patience possess ye your souls. So sometimes you just need to wait. More patient teaching. And that criticism will just fade away. Number five, consider the content. Consider the content. You see, some of, your, some of our best friends are those who disagree with us lovingly, openly, and intelligently. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, says Proverbs 27, verse 6. Helpful criticism is actually like good medicine. David Polison says, Critics like governing authorities are servants of God to, to you for good. He who sees into hearts uses critics to help us see things in ourselves. Outright failings of faith and practice, distorted emphases, blind spots, areas of neglect, attitudes and actions contradictory to stated commitments, and yes, strengths and significant contributions as well. So the first thing you need to do when you get a criticism is say this. Could my critic really be trying to help me And how can I improve myself and my ministry from this criticism? Is there a kernel of truth, or ten kernels of truth, in this particular criticism, which, if changes are made, will make me a better minister? Now, if that's the case, what we need to do is absorb the criticism, confess our fault, take the lead in self-criticism, and say, you know, you are completely right, thank you for correcting me, I see it more clearly now. You've done me a favor. Thank you so much, brother. Ask for forgiveness wholeheartedly and then make changes for the better and move on. Don't dwell on it forever. Make the changes and move on. Now, if the critic offers you absolutely nothing constructive, you've asked him for time to think about it, you've gotten back to him, you're kind and polite, and you say... I understand where you're coming from. I understand your rationale. And I've laid it before the Lord. And I think think that the way I'm handling things in this area, though, I really believe this is the correct way as far as I can see it. So I appreciate your input, but I'm going to just continue. um, If you can say that politely. And then you move on. But you see, the conclusion of both matters is you deal with it 
You face it between God and you. You either correct or you don't correct. But either way, you move on. You move on. You move on. You don't allow your ministry to become stagnated and, and enter some kind of paralysis because you're under criticism. It's like Nehemiah building the walls. You know, you've got the sword and the trowel. You can't just always be using the sword and nothing ever get done with the trowel. You've got to keep building. The work of the ministry has got to go on. You can't let a few people sign you into inaction. Now, when you consider this content, the worst thing you can do is become self-defensive or angry. I've been a minister for 30 years what, 32 years or so, and two times in the ministry. And I regret both of them immensely. I have blown up at people. I mean, blown up at people. Gotten very angry. Both of them were a disaster. And there's absolutely no excuse for it. Anger Never is a solution. If you feel yourself getting angry, you're better off just shutting down the visit with a prayer and, and saying, I'll come back and we'll deal with it again. I need to think about it more. Whatever. But don't respond in anger. It's not the way of the servant of God. If your conscience is clear, a simple, straightforward explanation can be helpful in certain cases. Though sometimes respectful silence is appropriate and effective as well. Mark fourteen sixty one. But at all costs, you see, you don't strive to justify yourself. My wife and I were sitting in a restaurant uh, one day, and I was wrestling with a problem. Someone's criticizing me, and I was wondering, should I explain it to them? This person was pretty critical of me. Maybe that would get me in deeper water. I don't know. It seems so. I, I, I always have this tendency inside of me to think that if I just explain things to people, they'll, they'll understand. Mm-hmm. You know, sort of like Luther going to the Pope. You know, if I just explain it, he'll become a Protestant. <laughs> doesn't work that way. Anyway, we're sitting in this restaurant and there's these packs of sugar with little sayings on the back and we're talking about what we should do. And I turn one over and it says... Don't explain. <laughs> your friends don't need it, and your enemies won't believe you anyhow. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth in that, actually. <laughs> Refuse to descend to the level of a negative critic. Don't render evil for evil. Fight God's battles, not your own, and you will discover that He will fight yours. It's not for you to repay. Romans 12, verse 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but give place, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. <coughs> and please don't take every whisper overly seriously. Sometimes ministers get into this mode. I've, I've got one brother, colleague, dear, dear brother. This is Achilles' heel. If someone says something evil about him, he's got to track it down. Who said? Who told that to that person? And it's like he's a policeman going after them. It's hopeless. Let it go. Do the work of the Lord. These things will fade away. There's an old Dutch saying that says, "Every rumor after 60 days will be dead." And if you walk worthy of your calling, you see, it'll be 30 days because people will realize this is not. The truth. Truth will vindicate itself after a while. So don't hunt down every little thing. Now, one more thing, consider yourself, I find extremely helpful, is to bury yourself in your work. Maybe this sounds not very spiritual but when I come home from a consistory meeting and I've been raked over the coals about something and I'm really down and discouraged I'll talk to my wife for a while and uh, if it's midnight by that time and I know that I'm not going to sleep well I'll go back to my study at midnight I'll just start working I'll work till three 
And that does a world of good for me. So I get involved in another project. It's like the son, you know, there was a, there was a father who went to teach his son uh, how, to, how to do sailboating. And they were out in the sea. And the father said, you know, when the wave comes over the ship and it's coming at you, don't just stand there and let the wave hit you. It'll throw you overboard. But as the wave hits you, shift the weight of your feet. And you'll be able to withstand a lot more. And I've always felt that in the ministry. I've always had to have other tasks. I've had to have another, for me, if I have another book that I'm writing, it's something I can take refuge in uh, when, I'm, when I'm coping with criticism or, uh, or teach another class or, or do something different to shift my weight, you see. So I don't just dwell on this and dwell on this and dwell on this. So don't let criticism fester. You've got lots of wonderful things to do. Bury yourself in your work. <coughs> Not to avoid it long term, but the short term hurt. Sometimes it's handled much better when you go back to work. Number six, consider scripture. Consider scripture. Some leaders are so delicate that they cannot endure criticism without crumbling. And that's, that's really my nature. Uh, to be quite honest with you, I grew up in a very peaceful home. I heard my parents argue once in their entire life, and it was over me. <laughs> but it was only once. And uh, when I entered the ministry, I just had this naive idea that you know everybody treated a minister pretty decently. And uh, I didn't have much emotional muscle developed for criticism. Other ministers are so battle-hardened by their past that they have the height of a rhinoceros and people can say anything about them. Like Theodore Friedenheisen in, in the 18th century had a little sign on the back of his carriage that said, go ahead and criticize me all you want, I don't care. Basically is what it said. <laughs> I want to do the work of the Lord regardless. I could never be Theodore Friedenheisen. Someone else has said the secret of successful ministry is developing the height of a rhinoceros while maintaining the heart of the child. I've been trying to do that for 32 years and never been successful yet. I don't know how you do the two. But there's some truth to it, I suppose. But how you do, we, we probably all gravitate, you see, toward one extreme or the other. Either we're too tender or we're too hardened. But what we need to do in each case is we need to use the scriptures. Let the scriptures help us. And I've got particular texts in my life. I'm sure you have them in your life that help you in your own weaknesses when it comes to criticism. One thing that really helps me is Romans 8.28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. So I, talk, I talk to myself when criticism comes. This is from the Lord. And this, is, this is going to work together for good. Somehow, certainly, I certainly don't understand how. What I do now thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. That's another text that's very important to me. But also this text, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. Be kind. Always be kind, no matter how people treat you. Be kind. Be kind. Kindness will eventually win the day. Now we went through a denom terrible denominational split in the early 1990s. It's very, very, very painful, difficult. I had people on the other side that wouldn't shake my hand. I wouldn't shake my wife's hand. And we still had to work with them. We still had to school together. We go to social situations where there's a school. So we decided together, we're going to still be kind to all these people. We're, we're going to go up to them, put out our hand. I even went to a man's relative who, who passed away. I mean, the, the man's relative passed away. I was in the funeral line. I went to, to, to say my sympathy to him. He got up to me and said, Nope. We just kept doing it. We just kept doing it. Kept putting out our hands. Three, four, five times. A couple of people refused to shake her hand. Eventually, what do you do? I mean, finally, one guy just kind of limply put out his hand. <laughs> but eventually, you win them over. Today, there's not a single person in that whole congregation that won't shake both of our hands. Because we persisted purposefully to show them kindness. 
And I, I, I feel very, very strongly about it. In fact, I had a member come to me and say, I've got to complain against you. You show more attention to your enemies than your friends. But I want to make sure that my enemies, you see, when I walk across the church parking lot, I want to make sure that they don't think I'm avoiding them. So I go out of my way to greet them and be kind to them. So use the scriptures to, to strengthen you, to help you. Plead those scriptures. Repeat those scriptures. Number seven. Consider the Lord Jesus Christ. If you forget everything else I say this morning, remember this. This is by far the best solution. Consider the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12.3 says, Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. And I read to you already the, the famous Petrine text. The point is this, you see. If Christ, who was perfect and altogether innocent, was spat upon and mocked and rejected and crucified, what can we imperfect pastors expect? And if one of Jesus' own hand-picked apostles betrayed him for a paltry sum and another swore that he did not know him out of fear for a servant maid, why should we expect to carry on our ministries without ever being betrayed or deserted? Actually, we should thank God that our critics don't know how bad we truly are. You see, Christ is absolutely innocent. We're always partially guilty. I once had someone really, really spread a terrible, terrible rumor about me. I don't even want to repeat it in case it gets taken from here. It was bad. It was altogether untrue. 100% untrue. There's not a speck of truth in that one. And I was angry. I was bitter. I was pacing my study. And I was frustrated. How could I stop this rumor? I was getting calls from different congregations. And finally, I tried to pray. I couldn't pray. And finally, in desperation, I don't know if you've ever done this, I just walked over to pick out a book and just start turning it over, start reading. I read a paragraph or two, and suddenly... I came across this. It was in John Brown's uh, Christian Pastor's Manual. Never forget it. He said, Do you have a critic who's spreading entirely false rumors about you? <laughs> Thank God they don't know half how bad you really are. <laughs> so there's truth in that, isn't there? No matter how bad people say things about us, really inside we're worse than that. So just humble yourself. Wait on the Lord. He'll vindicate you in due time. But I like to think of it this way. If Jesus Christ was willing to suffer so much for me, if he gave himself for his church, if he loved his bride so much, if he loved me so much, that he gave himself for me, to die for me, should I be willing to give myself away to his church to live for her? And that means coping with criticism. It's just part of the job. It's nothing compared to the privilege I get repatient. I sit in my study sometimes and I clap my hands for joy that I am called to be a servant of the Most High, the Living God. What a calling! My dad used to say to me when I was a boy, and I felt called to the ministry. He said, To be a minister of the gospel is more important than living in the White House. You see, we have so much in the ministry. We never have to wake up any morning in our life with a midlife crisis, do we? And say, oh, my job isn't worthwhile. We're dealing with the souls of men. Kind of privilege. I get to serve the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, today. Lord, help me. Don't let a little criticism make me turn aside from this tremendous calling. Consider Jesus Christ. Consider the faithfulness of Christ. Consider what He's done for me. Oh, I can never do enough for him. When we were young kids, my, my dad always said to us, I must have heard it a thousand times, you can never do enough for your mother. I know she's changed her diapers, she's done everything. You can never do enough for your mother. Well, I think that's the way a minister should feel about Jesus Christ. You can never do enough for him. My brethren, count it all joy when you suffer persecution for His name's sake. 
great is your reward in heaven. Every persecution you suffer for his sake will be a thousand times rewarded. Consider the Lord Jesus Christ and drink deeply of his love and find your delight in the triune God. When people reject you, go to that Savior who never rejects you, who loves you unconditionally with unspeakable love and you will conquer pessimism and you'll be able, in fact, to love your critic in return. So rather than focus on your critic, who seems to wield so much power. Focus on Christ's greater power and His undying faithfulness as your intercessor and your advocate at the Father's right hand. And trust Him once more to lead you through. Once more. He won't disappoint you. Sometimes we just need to commit the next moment to the Lord the next critic to the Lord. Sometimes we get overwhelmed in the ministry. I I know I do. I I have probably a half a dozen times in an average year where I'm driving to church and I'm just overwhelmed. I just feel like I can't preach. You talk about that dependency in the Holy Spirit we heard from Dr. Piper last hour. And I just am overwhelmed. I feel like the Spirit's going to desert me. I feel like I have nothing to say. I can't preach. I I feel like I absolutely know nothing. I get very quiet. And my wife will sense it. My whole family senses it. And she'll say something like, well, you've got it again, don't you? Mm -hmm. Say, yeah. She'll lean over and put her hand on my arm and say, the Lord will help you one more time. One more time. I'll get to the foot of the pulpit and I'll say, Lord, help me one more time. In weakness and fear and trembling. Yet with confidence because I know the Spirit will own the ministry. So you ascend the pulpit so weak. He helps you one more time. Oh, consider the faithfulness of Christ. Your critics will be dead and buried. And Christ will be alive forever. You will be with Him. It's going to be alright. Christ will outlast your critics. Number eight. Consider biblical saints. Consider biblical saints. Just give you one quick example here for time's sake. Consider Nehemiah. He's, he's 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 wonderful example of how to handle criticism. There were all these Sambalas and Tobias. And some of their criticisms were valid. Nehemiah's workers were not skilled. Many of them were not committed. Some sections of the wall were not strong. Some sections could not be rebuilt. So how does Nehemiah respond? Well, he commits his cause to God in prayer. He remembers that the source of his vision was God and not himself. That's a great help. If you can say, Lord, I, I didn't bring myself to this city and to this pulpit. Thou hast called me here. And then he sets up a guard and he revises his plan, notice this, according to circumstances without abandoning his vision. So he has a three-step response. And that's often what we need to do. First prayer, then remember, and then revise. But don't abandon. Don't abandon the vision. A failed plan does not equal a failed vision. Usually it means you have to swallow your pride, revamp it or redraft it, so that the vision can be implemented better in due time. Number nine, consider love. Consider love. Love the one who criticizes you. You say, how in the world can I do that? Well, you can't apart from Jesus Christ and His grace, but you can when you consider what Christ has done for you. Seek to understand them, first of all. Seek what makes them tick. And then, forgive them on the basis that Christ has forgiven you. Forgive them in your conscience, even if they haven't asked for forgiveness. 
I understand that you can't forgive them in their conscience for something they haven't confessed, but you can forgive them in your own conscience. And that's what gives you a peace that passes understanding. Spurgeon, I think, put it best. He said this, Unless you have forgiven others, you read your own death warrant every time you repeat the Lord's Prayer. Father, help us to forgive others as we forgive us as we forgive others. Spurgeon goes on to say, Forgive and forget. When you bury a dead dog, you don't leave its tail sticking up above the ground. (laughs) You see, again, this idea, be done with it and move on. Now when he says forget, he doesn't mean that you don't have it way back here in your mind. I mean, you don't go make the guy an elder the next week and say, this has all been done and forgotten. You do remember this man's, say, inconsistent personality. Maybe he's not fit for church leadership because of the criticism and so on. But you don't carry a grudge with you. And one way that can really help you here is to pray with your critic. Not just pray for your critic in private, that's important. But pray with your critic. And as you pray with him, be careful to be, be fully objective in that prayer. Don't you never use prayer to get at someone. Pray with integrity. Pray with humility. And then another way to love your critic is to feel pity for them. I'm talking now about really, really critical people. Have you ever just felt sorry for them? Instead of thinking about what they're doing to you, have you ever felt sorry for them? I had a family visitation visit one night with a man who was just very, very critical of my ministry. His father was very critical. He passed it on to his son. And he has five or six children, or my beautiful children. And he started criticizing me in front of the kids. And I said to him, uh, well, my friend, uh, let's just continue with a normal family visitation and maybe your children could go to bed at the end of the visit and then then we can talk more about this. Oh, no, he said. My children know all about it anyway. And I drove away from that house that night. Those kids heard that talk. I felt so sorry for him. What a future these kids have. Growing up being critical of a minister of the gospel. How tragic to be a parent who causes these little ones to stumble. And finally, put away anything that inhibits love. Peter says, lay aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings. The worst thing you can do is just keep talking about it. Talk to your wife about it. Talk to your family about it. It just keeps perpetuating itself. It's far better to confide in your wife about it once, deal with the thing, and then move on. Number ten. Consider long-term vision. Long-term vision. Remember, short-term criticism usually is dealt with and it's done away with a year from now. Think about this. A year from now. You'll hardly remember this criticism. Don't get so overwhelmed by it. That's the way to talk to yourself. You know, Abraham Lincoln was perhaps one of the most respected and most reviled presidents in American history. Thousands of people opposed his view on war and slavery. One day a friend pulled Lincoln aside and told him that the criticism had reached such a crescendo that it was as if Lincoln were surrounded by scores of barking dogs. And this was Lincoln's response. You know that during the time of the full moon, dogs bark and bark at the moon as long as it is clearly visible in the sky. And the friend was puzzled. He said, well, what, do you, what do you mean? What's the rest of the story? Lincoln said, there is no rest of the story because the moon keeps right on shining. You see, Lincoln said, was saying, I believe I'm completely right in this situation. My policies are right. In the long run, I'm going to win over the critics. The dogs are going to start barking. And, and the country is going to be unified around these principles. The moral of that for us today is that we don't let a few, I say it with reverence, barking parishioners destroy our ministry when we know we're in the right. Some things we cannot negotiate on. And we just have to persevere. 
So to obtain temporary peace with a few disgruntled members, we're prone to abandon long-term biblical vision that shines in our churches and ministries like a full moon. Don't do that. Don't be intimidated into capitulation on essentials by critics and by criticism. Don't allow a few critics to force you into their molds so that you live timid and hesitant lives, doing nothing, saying nothing, and worst of all, being nothing. And never give up. Never, never, never give up. As Winston Churchill said in his five-word famous speech to graduates. Persevere. Long-term vision. President Theodore Roosevelt said, it's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how, how the strong man stumbled that counts. It's not the doer of deeds who could have done better that counts. But the real credit in life belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by the dust and sweat and blood, who keeps striving valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, but arises again and goes back to the battle. The man who perseveres is the one who counts. And finally, number 11. Consider eternity. This is the last one. Consider eternity. Criticism pales in the light of eternity, doesn't it? Jonathan Edwards said, O Lord, in his resolutions when he was 13 years old, stamp eternity on my eyes. And I would say, stamp it on our hearts, stamp it on our ministry, stamp it on everything we have and everything we own. Eternity puts everything in a different light. And I had the privilege of going to Dundee to go see Robert Murray McShane's church, which I longed to do. And I stepped out into the adjacent um, graveyard and opened the gate to the graveyard. There was this large stone still there today, about six feet by six feet. And it has only one word written across the center of it. Eternity. I think McShane put it there. The word is now faded. You can barely trace it out. I think McShane wanted everyone who walked across that stone into the graveyard to, to consider, I'm going to eternity. And you see on the judgment day, Peter says, what, what thing have you if you render evil for evil? What will it be like to stand before God in the judgment day and say, Lord, I, any, everyone who's criticized me, I've given it back to them. I want to be able to say on the day of judgment, Lord, I've walked worthy of the vocation to which you've called me. I have not rendered evil for evil. I want him... All these precious, precious words. I want him to be able to say by grace to me, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And I have to give an account of every one of my members on the day of judgment. They have to give an account of what they've done with the word I brought them. And the example I brought them. But I have to give an account of how I've treated them. And the words I brought to them. I want to be able to do it with honor in his sight. Remember that in eternity our Savior will wipe away every tear from our eye. And he will be faithful to us. He will be waiting for us. He will never let us down. Every wrong will be made right. Every injustice will be judged. All criticism will be passed. All evil will be walled out. And all good will be walled in. And in heaven, there will be perfect unity. Everything will be well. Even Luther and Calvin will fully agree on every point. Our believing critics will embrace us and we will embrace them. There will be oneness in Jesus Christ, complete and perfect and visible. And three great truths will become reality in that day for us. First, we will understand that all the criticism we received here below was used in the hands of our potter to prepare us for Emmanuel's land. 
And second, we will see fully that all the criticisms we were called to bear on earth were but a light affliction compared to the weight of glory that awaits us. And third, we will see that we will be more than repaid for every affliction we endured on earth for the sake of our best and perfect friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. On that happy day, when this mortality shall put an immortality and this corruption in corruption, we will ever be with the Lord. And then it shall be fulfilled, the bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my King of grace, not at the crown he gifted, but on his pierced hand. The Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. So, conclusion let's stop our complaining about the criticisms we get in the ministry and count our blessings and let's persevere in the good fight of faith we have the best of assurances in that fight we've got the promises of God we've got the best of advocates the Holy Spirit we've got the best of generals Jesus Christ we've got the best of results everlasting glory so let's not resign but let's re-sign and lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for our feet you know when we can start complaining we can start complaining when we've given as much for Christ as he's given for us and that day will never happen so let's go forward lifting him up being optimistic about the work of the ministry yes we live in hard times yes we live in a day of small things but we live in a wonderful day of opportunity gird up the loins of your mind stand fast your savior is greater than Apollyon he's greater than the times and your sender will not desert you hold fast your profession even when friends desert you by clinging to your high priest who's holding fast to you and will never desert you He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Don't put your trust in princes or in a dying fallen world, but put it in a prince of peace. Look Christward. Lean Christward. Pray Christward. Preach Christward. Live Christward. That, after all, is the way to cope with criticism. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank Thee so much for Jesus Christ and His wonderful example for us. And we pray that Thou wouldst use this talk to help each brother here to cope with the next criticism and the next and the next that will come our way and to see that all these things will work together for good to conform us more to the image of Thy Son and to ripen us for glory, and to mature us in ministry. Help us, Lord, to rise above our natural self-defensiveness, and to use every criticism for true good and for thy glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.